Karma Whether or not you believe in this unseen force, there are stories to be found out in the world which provide some damning proof this vengeful power may exist. Believed to trail behind those who've done wrong but have yet to receive adequate consequences, karma is said to wait until their target lets their guard down. Only in those moments of unguarded time will karma come and strike with an indiscriminating sense of justice. This strike ends the tale of grievances the person may have left in their wake. If there is any true crime story that displays the full effect of karmic energies, it would undoubtedly be the story of one despicable man from Kentucky. This is the story of Mel Ignato, a tale that spans over two decades but ends with him getting just what he deserves. Born in Kentucky on March 26, 1938, Melvin Henry Ignato was viewed to be as average a man as any during the time. While he had an abusive streak which seemed to affect a significant number of his relationships, there isn't much information to refer to him in terms of Ignato before his crime in the late 1980s. However, he found residence in Louisville at some point during his life and had a number of relationships throughout his life with at least one of these relationships resulting in a child. This is confirmed by later news reports mentioning comments from Ignato's son. Brenda Sue Schaefer was a lovely woman who was adored by those around her. Her family and friends all described her as a bright-eyed person, though perhaps a bit naive. Schaefer also lived in Louisville and worked as a nursing assistant, though she hardly got a break as she also cared for her mother, who was sick with lupus. Whenever she was not at work, there didn't seem to be anyone who had anything negative to say about this reliable and hardworking woman. It is reported that Ignato and Schaefer had been dating for about two years and were even engaged, thinking about marrying. However, Ignato had his violent streak, which Schaefer grew increasingly and rightfully upset about. She told the people around her, the people who cared for her, that she planned on leaving the man very soon. From what is gathered, it reads as though Ignato was aware of Schaefer's plan to leave him. This looming threat did not sit well with Ignato, who did not like the idea of being broken up with. When Schaefer began pulling away from his abusive grasps, Ignato began to plan her demise. The planning began weeks before the actual crime, beginning with Ignato contacting an ex-girlfriend, Mary Ann Shore. There isn't a lot of information to be found on the relationship between Ignato and Shore, but it is easy to assume that they still had a communicative relationship despite being separated. With surprising ease, or perhaps surprising ease only to those on the outside looking in, Shore was quickly on board with the nefarious ideas Ignato presented to her. During the weeks of planning, it was decided Shore's home would be used as a place of torture and a grave would be dug amongst the trees in her backyard. By having this separate site, Ignato, who knew he would be a prime suspect, wouldn't have to worry about evidence. Within the weeks of preparation, the two would meet at Shore's house and choose a location for the grave, digging the hole in advance. Shore also spoke of the pair testing the home to see how well noises could be heard from the outside. This was tested by one person screaming in the house while the other listened outside for any commotion, proving this to be a heavily premeditated crime. It was September 23, 1988, when Schaefer drove to Ignato with the intention of either giving jewelry back or selling it. It is said Ignato convinced Schaefer to go with him to Shore's house, mentioning the woman potentially being interested in the jewelry Schaefer had. When the pair arrived at Shore's house, Ignato pulled a gun on Schaefer and locked her in the home. While held at gunpoint, Schaefer was made to strip and pose in various positions for Ignato, who was taking photos. From there, Ignato bound his victim and gagged her, tying her to a glass coffee table. The true horrors began here, as Ignato took his time raping, sodomizing, and torturing Schaefer. During this time, Shore was present and had taken the camera, capturing each violating action. It is reported the torment Schaefer experienced lasted for five hours before becoming overwhelmed and dying, her cause of death being suffocation with chloroform. After Schaefer was finally out of her misery, Ignato and Shore buried her body in the pre-dug grave. One last detail Ignato worried about was Schaefer's car, dropping it on the shoulder of a nearby interstate with a flat tire. While concerns started early, police finding Schaefer's car is what truly kickstarted the investigation. Due to his proximity with the victim and being the last person to have seen Schaefer alive, suspicions immediately fell onto Ignato. Still, he remained calm and collected, knowing no evidence would be found in his spaces. Due to the lack of physical evidence, but an abundance of circumstantial evidence, Ignato was invited to speak in front of a grand jury to clear his name. He accepted this offer, and during his testifying on his own behalf, he slipped up and named Mary Ann Shore. It did not slip past the prosecutors, who began the search for Ignato's accomplice. By the time officials were questioning Shore, the FBI was also involved in the case. It would not take much time before Shore was cracking under pressure, taking authorities to the grave she and Ignato had dug over a year after the crimes were initially committed. Due to the lapse in time, all physical evidence that could have been tested to put Ignato away was decomposed. Instead, officials worked with Shore and convinced her to wear a wire when going to meet with Ignato. 
In exchange for the information they gathered on the wire, Shore would be given a reduced sentence, protecting herself from the charges other than evidence tampering. From the interaction that followed between the two criminals, prosecutors were sure they had their case against Ignato under wraps. There would be a two-year delay after the body was found due to the notoriety of the case in Louisville, the case being moved to a smaller town outside of the metropolis. When court was underway, the first problem to surface with their evidence is in the disagreement on a word in the wire recording. While the officials thought Ignato said something about sight, the jury decided that he had said something about safe instead. This changed the value of what was spoken, and it held much less of an effect than initially suspected. This lack of value in the recording meant that they would have to rely on Shore's testimony. Shore brought along her own problems, beginning with her choice of attire for the court session. Shore showed up to the courtroom to testify wearing a miniskirt, immediately pitting a conservative Kentucky jury against her. The next major problem was Shore was unable to testify clearly, experiencing many moments where she would giggle or laugh as she spoke. Her humorous attitude and choice of clothing for the time period resulted in the jury viewing her as an unreliable witness. Defendants were also quick to jump forward, claiming Shore must have killed Schaefer herself. With all the evidence prosecutors thought they had deemed useless, for lack of a better word, the trial ended in 1991, with Shore getting a few years in prison for evidence tampering while Mel Ignato was acquitted. The decision from the jurors came as a shock for many, but it came at the bafflement of the judge. The decision of this case would actually drive the judge to write a personal apology letter to the family of Brenda Sue Schaefer for how wrong the case had gone, an act that is relatively unheard of. It would be another six months after Ignato's acquittal before hard evidence began to appear. The first piece of evidence to show itself was the bag of Schaefer's jewelry. The bag had been found in the home Ignato had lived in during the time of the murder. During the years following the crime, Ignato had moved out. A man working with carpet in the home came across it and immediately alerted authorities, who began to search the rest of the property. It was a short time later when the officials found the undeveloped tape films in the air duct of the home. Though they already had a sickening feeling they knew what they had uncovered, it was when the films were developed that they saw the truth. Everything Shore had said was the truth. Caught now, but protected under the law of double jeopardy, Ignato knew the court would not be able to try him for the same crime that they had failed to find him guilty of years before. Instead, Ignato chose to come completely clean about the crimes he had committed, deciding to cooperate with the authorities to reduce whatever sentence he would be given. To cooperate with authorities, Ignato confessed in detail to what happened on that September night in 1988. He spoke to the jurors about the torture he put Schaefer through before finally suffocating her with chloroform. After confessing to killing the woman, Ignato thought it would be appropriate to turn to look at Schaefer's brothers who were in the courtroom, telling them she died peacefully. When found guilty of perjury, Ignato was sentenced by the jury to serve eight years in prison, but would be released after five. This freedom would be enjoyed for a few years before Ignato found himself in jail again in 2002. After his first release on perjury charges, he ended up back in court for a case against Dr. William Spaulding, Brenda Schaefer's boss. Ignato had made claims Spaulding threatened to kill him if he didn't say where Schaefer was in the past. This case would gain him another nine-year prison sentence for perjury, but he would be released early once more. Released from his conviction in December of 2006, Ignato returned to Louisville, finding a new residence under five miles from the location he had ended Schaefer's life and hid her body. By the time of his release, Ignato was 68 years old. In the last days of his life, it is said by the neighbors above and below him that the elderly man struggled with pains and the inability to care for himself properly. It would be less than two years of freedom from jail before Ignatow's meeting with fate would finally occur. The city of Louisville was able to sleep soundly once more on September 1, 2008, when the news broke that Melvin Henry Ignato had died. The cause of death has not immediately been released by coroners, but Ignato's son would speak to the news to explain. From the detailing of his son's recount, it appeared as though Ignato had stumbled before falling onto the glass coffee table in the living area. Punctured and cut by the glass pieces, Ignato sustained a particularly nasty cut, which would ultimately lead to him bleeding out on the floor alone. Karma had finally caught up to him, taking his life on a glass coffee table just as he had done to Brenda Sue Schaefer nearly two decades earlier. True justice had finally been served. What did you think of the story of Mel Ignato? Do you think he got exactly what he deserved? Did you know double jeopardy could prevent murders from being retried when more substantial evidence is found? Are there any other true crime stories you'd like to hear? Leave your thoughts, comments, and suggestions down below, and don't forget to subscribe for more true crime stories.